attempted murder by strangulation, assault with intent to murder, kidnapping, two counts of assault, and battery with a dangerous weapon, which was the wall and the pencil like we talked about. That's been going on for quite some time, and at this time, it's still going on. June of 2014 is when this assault happened. December of 2015, 18 months later, he's found guilty. He's sentenced in January of 2016 for the Ritzer murder. Mm-hmm. And that process, he was like I said, he wasn't well behaved. Like he would be so right here in Salem District Court. I'm pointing, like you can see, it's a mile <laughs> away from here. Is is mm-hmm. where the Salem District Court was in Suffolk County uh, Superior Court. And he would have to appear there. We would be notified. Like, you know, don't drive in this parts of Salem. There would be road closures because of security being amped up. Both for wow, his own just to get into town. court. Yep, that tells you both how big of a security risk he was and how small Salem is. It was a big deal. And he, a couple of times, they were transporting him from the youth center, which is sort of on the south side of Boston in, in Dorchester. Yeah, right I think he, the he, one where the attack happened in. was in Dorchester, yeah. And so he was being transported from there. That's probably an hour and a half, maybe two hours, depending on the time of day that they're, they're doing the transport. They'd get him all the way up here and go through all the security procedures and then let him get dressed in street clothes. And then he'd refused to get out of his cell right after and all this, of that exactly this happened more than once and some of the times he was effectively forced out and some of the times they just gave up on him i don't recall him being disruptive in court he just refused to engage right i mean and he was refusing to engage at trial you know i think the first time it happened was the day that they brought the recycle bin into the courtroom so the jury could see it as evidence i believe that was the first day that he refused to come out of his cell There came a point where it kind of became obvious to everybody, like, this is not going to work. The whole trigger word or temporary insanity or permanent insanity or whatever you want to call it, like, it's not going to work. And I think in some bigger trials, that tide is sort of tangibly shifted. And a lot of defense attorneys then try to start preparing their client. Like, look, you're not going to walk. Yeah, this isn't looking good. And so I I suspect he got that, that talk. And after that, he was like, well, fine, screw it. I'm not coming. You know, Which I mean, is I, such the mentality that a child would have. Only a child would have the iron will and the inability <laughs> to foresee consequences to actually take that tantrum all the way through to fruition to where he actually gets his way. An adult would have given up because they're going to punish you. You're going to be prosecuted for something else if you don't come out. Seeing that this was a child, his temper tantrums literally work. And continue to work because I'm pretty sure he's not having to go to trial, you know, show up in court for hearings, like you said, even on this second charge. So it was a happening. He was found guilty in January 2016. So right around the time that he turned 17 years old. And I feel like once that sentence happened, he just stopped engaging. But the thing is, once you've been found guilty of one big bad thing, Mm -hmm. it starts to become a lot easier for the court to be like, all right, shithead, just stay, like, whatever. And so they will try you in absentia where they won't do that for the first one. Yeah, I mean, look at the Golden State Killer being wheeled in and refusing to speak. Right, right? yeah, but they still totally. wheeled his blank stare in in order to be indicted. And the first round through, your first pass through, like, they need to make sure everything is checked, both because the prosecution wants to make sure that We've crossed all the T's and dotted all the I's. Oh, yeah. So the conviction doesn't end up getting thrown out or have something extremely appealable going on with it. Everybody was really, really careful with him from the moment he was found on the side of Route 1 to make sure we do everything by the book. Super careful. Like, they were really careful about things like, are we going to identify him? They went back and forth heavily on really right, allowed right. the, the press to identify him. But the problem is the press is not stupid. And so you have a 14-year-old who goes missing and then is sort of very quietly announced found. And then they're not sending out a press release the way they normally do. Like, hooray, we found this kid. And at the same high school, on the same day, we find a teacher who's been killed. Like, the press put it together. And so everybody was like, all right, well, we know his name. Well, and they're charging him as an adult, so they don't have to keep a secret unless his lawyer goes to court and says that she doesn't want them to be able to identify him. But What's the point in that? It's not going to matter. This is going to be a huge high profile case. It's going to get a lot of news coverage. So it's going to be pretty obvious that he's going to get identified immediately. So his parents divorced. 
his mom pretty much, I mean, I saw her appear there during his trial. Did any of his other family members attend court hearings I as far as you know? I don't think so. His So his mother is Brazilian. There was talk about culturally and language wise and a lot of things like, could she cope? I speak the language and I'm from the culture and I couldn't cope if I was there for one of my kids. Um, oh yeah, who there could was, cope? There was a lot of blame by people who may find it easy to blame, which by which I mean people who didn't have kids, I think. Pointing fingers about she should have known something was wrong with him. Why had she not had him in therapy already? You know, blah, blah, blah. Why didn't she report him? What do you think her? of that? Well, it's bullshit. I mean, to get again, to get technical, there's a certain degree of responsibility that we have to pay attention to our kids and to meet their needs. But you go ahead and find me a 14-year-old boy who says, yes, mom, please sign me up for therapy. It's tough. It's not unheard of, but it's not common. I don't know at what point she moved to the U.S. Mm -hmm. in her life. But right. there's a certain degree of just culturally, the women aren't encouraged to press the man for you need to go seek help. There's something wrong with you. Like, it's not done. And he was much bigger than she was, much taller than his mother. And I think that tide turned for her, too, that she realized this stuff's going down. And so she stayed there in sort of a display of support. And his father did come up. But there was a lot of tension in a whole lot of directions. And and so I just feel like, how, do, how are you supposed to know? You know, this is not just like a zebra in a herd of horses to pick out which one's different. Like... This is a zebra with an invisible disease. How are you supposed to know? It's so, so rare what he did. Right, right. I do know that at some point while she's being questioned by the police, she admits that she knows that he was capable of snapping. So I'm sure that, you know, the public sees that and they, they take that as. But you can't even really do that because snapping could be hitting your mom, not murdering your math teacher. Well, exactly. And okay, they're newly going through a divorce with two teenagers who are, I'm sure, not delighted with this turn of events. They've been moved several oh, states right. away. You know, Massachusetts, Tennessee, not so much alike. And so mm -hmm. sort of everything's been shifted. Kids tend to get very angry at their parents when divorce happens. So while I'm big on the don't stay together for the sake of the kids, I also can see why it's easier to do so because kids can make Right. It and this was not a great divorce either. I mean, this was a volatile relationship that was breaking up. Then you have to look at the impact that has on her and her ability to mother when she's dealing with many things in her own life. You know, it's just kind how, of like yeah, a how many times do we blame of, her and she just took it, you know, and, and after a while you see like, yeah, my kid can have meltdowns, but he's not trying to kill me. We're fine. You right. Know? He's doing as well as can be expected. Exactly. We're pulling through. It's fine. Like that's probably I feel like that's not an unreasonable way at all to feel or to, to react. Right. And so people are so quick to point fingers and to act like somehow they could do it better. But hindsight, man, hindsight is real good. And the reality is it doesn't work. Do you know anything about Philip Chisholm's sister? They protected her name fairly carefully, uh, the sister's name. And so it doesn't take moving very far away before you could say, yeah, that sucks. That's my cousin. For the most part, you're not even allowed to enter into adult court unless you're like a witness or similar uh, until you're 16. She was only 12 when this all went down. Yeah, I've never seen her and I just hope she's doing okay. I didn't know how much any of his family members had spoken publicly about anything. Not, not much at all that I know of. It's very minimal. There's a lot of shame involved in it. And um, I mean, I've seen, there's photos of her out there. You can you can find. The only other thing that kind of hits the news here and there it has to do with the, the Ritzer family. And in most cases, mm -hmm. it's positive. Like they have a, a an annual benefit run, you know. And there's also a scholarship, right? Right. And there's just, there's different things, different ways that they have set up to memorialize her. And they did um, end up filing a civil suit in 2016, and they sued, I'm pretty sure, like the school, the town. They sued everybody. The, the yeah. cleaning crew, that company that cleaned the bathroom. They sued everybody. And that's one of those things. On the one hand, they're saying, like, it's not about the money. We're just suing to improve protocol or whatever. And we don't want this to happen again. But the reality is it's not going to happen again. Right. Of course it, it is. Already but it's not. You know, exactly. That there's, there's no real way to protect against something like this in the way that they're speaking. Somehow better surveillance. Like this was pretty much state-of-the-art surveillance. 
It just wasn't intended for catch people in the act. And I mean, most surveillance isn't. They want someone to blame because it's just so unfathomable a crime that in a place where you imagine hundreds of people walking around through the day that this could happen so early in the afternoon. You know, it's so shocking and unbelievable that it makes them think it's also in some way preventable. It's not a foreseeable crime. You're going to sue the school. Like, I don't like it. I really hate that they're suing the cleaning crew. I really hate that. Because the cleaning crew walked into a girl's bathroom in a high school. They found what they characterize as a lot of blood, but not carry at the prom. It was something they were able to clean up in the matter of an afternoon. And the head janitor, he did find it suspicious. He did testify that he went to, I think, the assistant principal's office, but there was a language barrier and he didn't feel like he was all the way able to convey his concerns. He was told to just clean it, which he did, because at the same time, like you said, it didn't look like a murder scene. Kids do pranks. Nobody really you're knew because stupid. you're not going to assume that you just walked into a murder scene. Right. Why would you think that? Right. You're at a high school, for goodness sake. You would never assume that. Which is how you come to the conclusion that this is an unpreventable crime. See, it would be different if the end result of this suit was a change to something that would make a difference, like a change to some kind of legislation. But there's not going to really, I mean, update the security system. You don't need a lawsuit to do that. And what are you going to update it to do? Look for murders? Like, there's no outcome other than monetary gain, which, you know, I'm not saying they don't deserve, but this kind of lawsuit, I think, would be buoyed by some kind of change for the better. This feels like sort of one of those steps you almost have to take so that then if they choose to go the way of politics and legislation, they want to be able to say, look, we didn't do this for money and we didn't even do this for revenge. Now we are seeking change and we are seeking it formally and we are seeking it in this way. And that's a long process. That's a long view. And so you've got to get him to get the immediate, like the criminal justice and the civil suit. Those have to be dealt with. Boiled down to is there was no laws to change. He was already breaking like the biggest, baddest law there is. How do you make a child obey that law? You know, that's sort of the basis of your whole show is about like, look, most kids are terrified of laws, are terrified of rules in the first place, even if they don't know what's going to happen, even if they don't know the consequences. They're just afraid of getting in trouble. That's how a normal person is supposed to be in general. I mean, I tell people all the time that I want my kids to fear me first and like me second, right? And I don't want them to fear a thing, like a, a specific act. I just want them to have this sort of creeping your cloud of dread about I'm going to get in trouble. Right. But at the end of the day, like we don't even spank. Well, it's more like a fear of disappointing me. That's what you really want to instill in your kids. (laughs) Don't don't get used to disappointing me and think that I'm not noticing. Yeah, I still have parents and I still worry about getting in trouble. It never (laughs) is supposed to go away. True. You know what I mean? So, So... So this kid here has thought it through. He knows he is going to do a bad thing. Like, there is no way we can pretend that he didn't know. So you don't get to pretend this this whole trigger word, which, let's, let's break that down. First of all, I don't like the phrase trigger warning because it's used so often that it has devalued the concept. I think it's, it's an important concept. It's become a concept. cliche. I'm going to give a trigger warning. I have heard hosts laugh about it and minimize it. It's like, okay, look, I don't need you to take it seriously. What people have lost track of is that it only works as a concept if you think about the person as a loaded weapon. They have to be so wound so tightly, so high strung. And that's what PTSD is in a lot of ways, is that you are on the verge of a panic type feeling at all times. You are constantly feeling threatened or feeling immediately in danger a lot of right and on a high alert hyper vigilant they call it where you're constantly Mm -hmm. scanning ptsd when you're in the throes of it the overhead movement of a ceiling fan or anything that you see peripherally your brain can interpret as that is about to kill me depending on what you've lived through but other people are going to notice that they're going to know that you have this sort of it's not just an explosive temper but that you have this sort of overreactivity to the world around you that you are Mm -hmm. perceiving threat where threat doesn't exist And so the concept of a trigger word means that this person has to be wound so tightly all the time that all it takes 
is a single word for them to go over the edge and lose all control. Well, you know what? The other people in the room are going to see it happen when it happens. And we would have seen it on the video, which we did 100%. not see. That's not what we would saying. have literally walked out after her, run down the hall. 